Let's now cover financial independence. At least we'll get started. Everybody has to wrestle now with their own concept of financial independence or getting rich or becoming wealthy. I know some people are a little uncomfortable with those kind of phrases, and I can understand that. You know, we've heard the phrase, which is true, to love money would certainly be evil. But money's not evil. There is some evil ways to acquire it. The difference between greed and ambition. Contrary to the movie Wall Street, greed is not good. Greed is evil and must be dealt with. Greed is evil. Greed hopes for something for nothing. Greed hopes for more than its share. Greed hopes for something at the expense of others. We call that evil. Right, we should lock them up. It's true. Make them pay the price. Greed is not good. Here's what is good. Ambition. Legitimate ambition. Legitimate ambition says, I only want something at the service of others. Not the expense of others, but at the service of others. Jesus gave the greatest scenario for success when he said, whoever wishes to be the greatest, nothing wrong with wishing to be the greatest. It's called enlightened self-interest. But he gave the key to those who wish to be the greatest. Here's what he said. Find a way to serve the most. Service to many leads to greatness. Not the expense of many. Not at the calamity of many. The greed for power caused Stalin in his day and time to kill 30 million of his own countrymen. His greed and lust for power was so powerful. It is true. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Stalin, probably one of the best examples. He was willing to kill 30 million of his own countrymen to satisfy his greed for power. Power at the expense of others, not at the service of others, but at the expense of others. But Jesus turns the whole scenario around and says, to be the greatest, the most powerful, is a worthy ambition as long as it's done in this mode. Here it is, at the service of many. Service to many leads to great wealth. Service to many leads to great recognition. Service to many leads to great satisfaction. Zig Ziglar probably said it as well as anybody could say it. If you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything you want. That's not greed. It's called legitimate ambition at the service. But I know some people have, you know, they're struggling with this idea and we talk about how to get rich. I've been teaching kids, right, all these years, how to be rich by 40, 35 if you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. And some people are a little disturbed by that, teaching kids how to get rich, teaching kids how to make a fortune. So I've modified it a little bit and here's the best I've been able to come up with. And that is the goal to become financially independent, a little softer than rich a little softer than make a fortune and sometimes it's a little easier for it to go down or at least comprehend if it's put I think in these terms financial independence here's my definition of financial independence the ability to live from the income of your own personal resources it's powerful and I think it's a worthy goal I think it's a worthy and legitimate ambition to render good service, to develop skills in the marketplace, and to become so valuable that you can have the resources and finally have enough resources, well invested, to where you could live independent from the income of your own personal resources. Then if you do wise things with your resources and the income, all the things you'd like to do, the projects you'd like to support, things you'd like to take care of that you can't take care of now, I think it's a worthy ambition, financial independence. With that background, let me recommend a book for you to read. The title is The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. Perhaps you've already read it. I would suggest that you read it again. It's just a small book. You can read it in one evening. I call it the appetizer for the full discourse on the subject of financial independence. Now, let me give you the major theme of the book. The major theme is that what you do with what you have is more important than what you have. 
What you do with what you get is more important than what you get. What we do with what we have says so much about us. It reveals our philosophy of life, our attitude, what we know and what we think, and the makeup of our character. It is a reflection of what is going on inside of our head and within our value system and decision-making process. It also reveals our ability to weigh and to perceive. The outer is always a reflection of the inner. It is an indication, a reading, a revealing. It speaks, it tells, it shows. Remember that key phrase I gave you earlier? Everything is symptomatic of something, and it is symptomatic of something right or something wrong. It is a wise policy not to ignore the symptoms, for they can be early signs of a poor choice of philosophy, or a sign that something important is being misread, misunderstood, miscalculated. So of all places, take a look here. What you are doing with your money says something about you. Now, what you're doing may be okay. All I'm suggesting is that you take a look. Let me give you some of the details of a good financial plan as suggested by Clayson's book. First, a very broad but important statement. Learn to live on 70% of your net income. Net meaning the money you have left after paying your taxes. The reason it's 70 is because you're going to be doing some very special things with the 30%. So what's left, 70%, is yours to spend. Now let's talk about the all-important subject of how you allocate the 30%. I remember one day saying to Mr. Shove, if I had more money, I would have a better plan. He said to me, Mr. Rohn, I would suggest that if you had a better plan, you would have more money. So it's not the amount that counts, it's the plan that counts. It's not what you allocate, it's how you allocate it. Here's the first part of the allocation process. Of the 30% you're not spending, 10% should go to charity, giving back part of what you have taken out to help those who cannot help themselves. I think that's a good percentage. Now, you can pick your own percentage. It's your life and it's your plan. But giving your money to a church or to an institution is a good idea. More often than not, they can find the people who are in need. But whether you administer it yourself or give it to an institution to distribute, 10% should be given to charity. And by the way, the best time to teach this allocation process is when a child gets his first dollar. Take him on a visual tour. There's nothing better than visual to illustrate what you're trying to teach. Take him to where some very unfortunate people live who cannot take care of themselves. Kids have big hearts. If they see the problem, they won't have any trouble giving a dime out of every dollar. And one more thing. The time to start this is when the amounts are small. It's pretty easy to flip a dime out of a dollar and it's a little more difficult to give away a hundred thousand out of a million. You say, oh, if I had a million, I'd give a hundred thousand. I'm not so sure. That's a lot of money. Best we start you early, so you will have the habit before the big money comes your way. Now, here is what to do with the next 10%. Set aside 10% for capital you manage. That is, capital you find ways to utilize. Do some buying and selling yourself. Buy something, fix it, and sell it. Engage in commerce, even if it's only a part-time venture. Your home is a major capital project. In my opinion, we should all engage in capitalism in this country. Here, we believe capital belongs in the hands of the people. Communism teaches that capital belongs in the hands of the state. That's a great difference in ideology. I guess communism feels that humans are too dumb and stupid to know what to do with capital. So it should all be given to the state. Let the state run everything and let the people meekly show up for their work assignments. In our country, we believe the genius to know what to do with capital resides in the populace, the people, the genius to come up with ideas for goods and services brought to the marketplace. It has built a dynamic enterprise known as capitalism and has created opportunities 
in abundance. Now, here's the third 10 cents from every dollar, and that is capital you provide. Take 10 cents out of every dollar and put it in a financial institution. And now we have come to a major benefit for all of us if you bring this 10% of your earnings to the marketplace. You see, some projects in our society need more capital than one person can provide. So we have a system whereby all of us can loan or invest our money in capital provided so that large businesses can be built to provide more jobs and products and service and help create an even more dynamic society. So 10 cents out of every dollar should go into a savings account. I really prefer to call it an investment account because, and kids will love this, they pay you for the use of your money. You can get back the money you loaned and you will have more profit from what you are paid for the use of your money. And be sure that you teach this, that if kids start this program from whatever they earn on a job or in engaging in enterprise or both while they are in their teens, by the time they are 40, they will be wealthy enough to be able to do what they want to do the rest of their lives instead of all their lives doing what they have to do. Now, from your teenage years, it could take a much shorter period of time to become financially independent, depending on what ideas and opportunities you take advantage of. Mrs. Fields developed a new chocolate chip cookie and became a millionaire before she was 30. Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookies. What an example of capital in the hands of the people, not in the hands of the state. A 10-year-old takes a dollar, searches around the community and finds a broken, abandoned wagon, pays a dollar for it, brings it home, cleans it up, sands off the rust, paints it till it's shiny and new, straightens out the wheel, and sells the like new wagon for $11. You ask, does a 10-year-old deserve $10 profit? And the answer is, of course. Society now has a mended wagon. And that's what it's all about. Find something and leave it better than you found it. Create a value. Build an equity. It's how we build this most dynamic society called America. And everyone can contribute. Everyone can bring some value to the marketplace. We can all be students of capital, profit, equity, and value. We can all engage in enterprise. We can all participate in the disciplines that bring wealth of lifestyle and treasure. All of us and our children can build the most powerful and attractive society ever. We have the knowledge, the tools, the schools, the market, the resources. All we need is the will. Let each of us begin. Its riches are for the having. Here's two or three more parts of financial independence. Number one, keep strict accounts. This is the best of disciplines, keep strict accounts. Did you ever hear this expression? I don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear that? I don't know where it all goes. Oh, we'd love to have you run our company. You don't know where it all goes. Whoa. Did you ever hear this? It just gets away from me. It just seems it just gets away from me. Uh, we'd love to turn the world over you. It just gets away from you. Come on, you gotta have better disciplines than that. Let that be the 90%. Let that be the scenario of the 97%, but don't let it be your scenario. Don't let it become your philosophy. Keep strict accounts. Next, a new attitude. I had to develop a new attitude as well as new concepts. Here's what I used to say. I hate to pay my taxes. Shelf said, well, that's one way to live. I thought, well, doesn't everybody hate to pay their taxes? He said, no, no, a few of us have gotten way past that. He says, once you understand what taxes are, here's what taxes are in our governmental system in our society. Taxes is how you care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. Democracy and liberty and freedom, free enterprise. Wouldn't you want to feed the goose that lays the golden eggs? 
Somebody says, well, the goose eats too much. That's probably true. I understand that. That. Of course, that's true. But see, better a fat goose than no goose. And here's the truth be known. We all eat too much. Let not one appetite accuse another. Of course, the government needs to go on a diet. So do most of us. But hey, you still have to care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. Once you understand that that's what it's for. See, it is so important, the right attitude. Here's what I used to say. I hate to pay my bills. You open up the mails, nothing but these window envelopes. Bills, I hate to pay my bills. Shelf said, well, that's one way to live. I said, well, doesn't everybody hate to pay their bills? He said, no, some of us are way beyond that. I said, is it possible to love to pay your bills? He said, yes. Reduce your liabilities, increase your assets. Wouldn't you love to do that? So start a whole new attitude here. Next time you pay $100 on an account, put a little note in there and say, with great delight, I send you this $100. I mean, they don't get many letters like that. Reduce my liabilities, increase my assets. My picture's changing, my picture's improving. I love to pay my bills. Keep the money in circulation. Pay my taxes, feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's a matter of attitude. And here's the last on attitude. Everybody must pay. Of course, life is called opportunity, but life is called price that we must all pay, we must all share. One of the classic stories of all time from ancient Bible script says, Jesus one day and his disciples were standing by the church treasury, synagogue treasury, watching people as they came by and put their offering in the treasury. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Jesus and his disciples standing by the treasury while everybody walks by. Jesus says, how much was that? How much was that? Interesting. And the story said some people came by, put in big amounts. Some people came by, put in modest amounts, average amounts. And the story says then a little lady comes by and puts in two pennies in the treasury. Jesus says to his disciples, look at that. Look at that. His disciples said two pennies, two pennies. What's two pennies? Jesus said, no, you don't understand. She gave more than everybody else. They said two pennies is more than everybody else. He said, yes because I'm certain that her two pennies represented most of what she had. And if you give most of what you have, then you've given the most. Wow, what a lesson to learn. It's not the amount. It's what it represents of your life that counts. Now let me give you the wisdom of the scenario that did not occur. And this is the greatest of wisdom. And in my own particular peculiar brilliance, I have the ability to record for you what was not recorded in the scenario of the story. Here's what did not occur, which may teach us one of the greatest of the wise things that was taught in this scenario. Here's what did not occur in the scenario. Jesus did not reach into the treasury and get this little lady's two pennies and run after her and say, here, little lady, my disciples and I have decided that you're so pitiful and you're so poor that we've decided to give you back your two pennies. I'm telling you that did not occur. If it would have occurred, she would have been, would have been what? Insulted. She would have rightfully said, I know my two pennies aren't much, but it represented most of what I had. And would you insult me by not letting me contribute what I wanted to contribute, even if it's only two pennies? I'm telling you that did not occur. Here's part of the wisdom of the story that was not recorded. Jesus left her pennies in the treasury, meaning everybody has to pay, even if it's only pennies. That's the key. And whether you start with pennies or whether you start with dollars or whether you start with nothing, remember, part of the scenario is to spend, of course. Part of the scenario is to invest and part of the scenario is to show a profit and part of the scenario is to help take care of people who can't take care of themselves. If you'll set up your own philosophy, I'm not asking you to buy my philosophy. I'm not asking you to adopt my numbers. I'm only wanting to provoke you to think for you to come up with a splendid economic philosophy that's got you up early and got you up late, 
got you thinking in pondering ways to use your resources and turn it into the dreams you want.